would have been a lot easier if we had closed like on the 25th or so of the month. I like around the 25th, 20th to 25th, because that's usually time to collect most of the rent for that month and it'd be prorated at closing, but it still gives you that window of time to send out notices or your property management company to send out notices to the residents and introduce themselves and make sure they get set up to pay the new management company. That way the next month's rent doesn't go to the previous owner. So it's kind of a, a balance you have to find there. Welcome everyone to the Multifamily Deal Structuring Monday, where we will discuss about the apartment deal that our guests have closed. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you get notified whenever a new episode is released. Our guest for today is Candice Pilgrim. So Candice is the managing partner of Apollo Capital and the co-founder of Multifamily Women's Mastermind. So he, she holds the bachelor's degree in both biochemistry and microbiology prior to turning her focus to real estate. So Candice owned and operated a successful electronics wholesale business for eight years. Her real estate journey begin, began with uh, single family rehabs and rentals, private lending, and solo 401k investing. In 2018, her focus shifted to multifamily acquisitions where she excels in underwriting, project management, and asset management. So she is currently invested in 500 units in three states as a limited partner and actively manages three assets totaling 90 units in Alabama and North Carolina. Here's the episode. Uh, hi, Candice. Uh, welcome to the Multifamily Deal Structuring Monday, uh, where we will discuss all about uh, your first uh, G um, multifamily transaction. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, here in the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so let's start with uh, if you can uh, tell us about uh, yourself. I'll keep this brief because I know you probably want to jump into the meat of the deal, but just a, a brief background, I guess. I'm married, been married for 11 years to my husband, Casey, and we have one son, a four-year-old boy named Carson. We live in Birmingham, Alabama, and we don't, neither of us have a, a W-2 job or a typical nine to five. We've had an electronics wholesale company since 2012. So we've been, you know, self-employed or business owners or whatever you want to call it since 2012. And we've really just now over the last year started the transition into full-time multifamily and away from that other business. So that's kind of where we're at right now, but I'll keep all the other details out for the moment so we can jump into the fun stuff. Okay. Yes. So uh, before jumping to uh, multifamily, did you have any kind of uh, single family, or, I mean, uh, residential uh, real estate experience prior? Yeah, a little bit. So my first investment properties were single family, and that was in 2018. We did buy two single family rental homes, and we implemented the Burr strategy before we officially jumped into the multifamily space. Um, but other than that, prior to 2018, no investment experience. We did we bought a, a single family home to live in as a personal residence, and then we did the the typical buy under market, live in it two years at the two year mark sell it for the gain and, and save on the taxes. Uh, and then we also built a custom home. So that was a learning experience for both of us as well. Oh, All that was prior to 2018. That was 20, 2015, 2016. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think that, that, that's nice. What uh, factors or how did you end up in uh, multifamily? Well, uh, I initially was looking for just investment opportunities in general, because we had uh, by 2017, we had quite a bit of capital built up from that electronics business that we no longer needed to redeploy into that business. So I was looking for, for passive investments or, you know, some way to invest that capital. I tried the stock market first for a while. And then um, by 2018, early 2018, I, I sold all the stocks off and decided real estate was a better fit for us. So that's when I started exploring single family or multifamily. And like I said, we did the two single families first, but very quickly realized that multifamily was the way to go in terms of scalability and getting to where we wanted to go faster. So we, we quickly transitioned into that mid-2018. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, the route to go, I think I heard it from someone. Uh, if you will start, I mean, if they will start uh, fresh, they will start like... Uh from directly commercial instead of the, the single, because you can, at least the, the growth is, uh, is really big compared to the uh, residential. Yeah, for sure. And we actually started out even, it was very quick transition from single to multi 
but then also a very quick transition from passive to active because once yeah. we transitioned into multifamily in 2018, you know, I, I, I just wanted to passively invest. We had this other full-time business we were running. So I just wanted to throw some capital into a few, you know, passive syndication type deals and then realized that I, I really love multifamily. I'd rather do this full-time and actually be a full-time multifamily owner and operator. So it was a, just a passively was a quick stepping stone for me to jump into the active side yeah. of things. Yeah, that, that's nice. Then, uh, yeah, any limiting belief that you have and uh, how were you able to overcome it to get to your uh, first deal? I don't really know if you'd call this a limiting belief. It more, It's more just a fear, I guess. But I was super terrified of making a mistake. You know, I know that you hear analysis paralysis. I don't know if you'd want to call it that. But, um, you know, I was just so scared to lose money and so scared I would do something wrong and just in general didn't have a lot of confidence, I guess, in my knowledge and myself when I first got started. So regardless how many books I read and how many podcasts I listened to, I just yeah. never felt that confidence to jump in. And I finally just realized like, I've just got to fail forward, just got to jump in and do it. And because I basically learned best by doing so I'm glad I did. Yes, yes. I think I, I heard it from one of the, the, I mean, one of the podcasts that I, I listened to is uh, Fail Forward Fast. So just yeah. jump into it and, and as long as you, I, I mean, get, take uh, the amount of, uh, do do the background check on the, the, the property and everything. So just mm -hmm. to me, uh, yeah, yeah, just to minim uh, minimize the risk. But yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yeah, let's go, uh, jump to your uh, first deal in multifamily. Uh, what's the source of that deal? So first of all, just as a background real quick, this is technically my second deal that I'll be talking about today, but it was my first do it myself type deal. So my first deal in multifamily was a joint venture project where I was primarily a capital partner. So it's, it was a little bit more active than you know an LP investment, but it wasn't as active as if I were to buy something myself or be the, the sponsor of the deal. So the, the deal I'm talking about today is technically my second deal, but it's my biggest learning experience. So source of the deal, um, the quick answer would be off market from a broker, but the little bit longer answer would be, because there's an interesting kind of backstory with this deal. I saw this deal on LoopNet in March of 2018 first, not by the seller I ended up buying it from, but I'll explain. Um, so I saw it on LoopNet. I submitted an LOI. They, they were asking $45,000 a door. I submitted an LOI for $33 a door. They countered $40 a door. We could just never come to an agreement. So I walked away from that deal and forgot all about it. Then a few months later, I got a call from a broker that I had a great relationship with at the time. And he said that he, act, well, back up a sec, he actually owns his own properties as well. So he buys deals and he brokers deals. So he had gotten this subject property under contract, this 40 unit property under contract as part of a larger portfolio of, of 200 plus units by the same seller. So because he got the whole thing under contract, he was able to cost basis wise save on, on the price per door. And he was willing to sell this 40 unit property to me for the 33 a door that I had originally bid on the deal. Oh, this deal required a ton of work. All the other properties in the portfolio were turnkey, and that was more of his business model. So it was basically a win-win. He would flip that one deal to me. Like as soon as they closed, I would still do my formal due diligence. Then we would close again. So double close. Um, but it was a win-win because he got rid of a headache property and I got the property for the price that I wanted. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah. I think that that's a good also like a strategy for the the let's say the one who's buying right that uh, if you can buy because I think some people are buying I mean selling in uh, as a portfolio then you can kind of get a discount because let's say if you're buying everything mm -hmm. especially like uh, if uh, some of the properties in are in in bad shape so they are just kind of mixing it with their good stuff so that uh, it's kind of still okay as a whole right portfolio. Yeah. That's nice. So with this uh, 40 units, uh, where is this uh, located? Birmingham, Alabama, which is where I'm located as well. So right in my backyard. Oh, that, that's nice. It's close to you. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, yeah, what's the class of the property? Is it a B or C? C class. It's a 70s property. Okay. Then uh, I think I already told the story of this property. Then, uh, yeah, for this property, where 
when you were looking at the T12 and Rentrol, was there any kind of uh, red flags or anything that stands out when you're checking? Yeah, there, there were three main things that I guess made this one a little bit unique or that stood out to me as red flags right away. Um, first of all, I noticed that there was absolutely no bad debt at all listed, which mm -hmm. is, you know, not possible, first of all, especially with the tenant profile that was at this property at the time, because this property was very distressed at the time I took over. So I knew that that was not the case. So it ended up they had given me an accrual rent roll, which is common, but um, they hadn't written off their bad debt yet. So I requested a cash, I say rent roll, I meant T12s. I suggest, I um, went back to them and I said, well, I really need a cash T12 that would show your actual collections since you haven't written off your bad debt and your accrual T12 is showing zero bad debt. So anyway, long story short, I finally got the, the correct T12 and um, it was showing about 10% bad debt, which is huge. I mean, that moves the NOI big time. So that was one thing. Uh, secondly, I noticed the water bill for this property was extremely high, uh, almost double what, what it should be. So that was a potential value add play I identified. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing was I noticed that there was $16,000 a year in a cable contract. And I, I later found out that that transferred to a new owner and you couldn't terminate it because it, it transferred by ownership. So that was that was another big thing that, you know, some people might have missed or assumed that that could go away when that was not the case. It needed to be underwritten in the pro forma as well. Okay. Yeah. I think that that's a good point, and especially on the, the I mean, the contracts that they have, the existing contracts, either Landry or like this uh, cable com company. Then mm -hmm. uh, if, especially if you're kind of targeting, oh yeah, year one, I can reduce these cable services, but you need to make sure first the contract is how many years do they have? Right. Yeah. Some of those cable contracts are four year contracts. And, and the thing with those are usually the, the, the owner that goes under contract with the cable company, they get a large incentive check for doing that. So they benefit from it. But then the ongoing payments of the cable contract, say they went, they went under contract with this cable company two months ago, then they sell, well, they got the benefit, but the new owner has to pay the contract and does not get the benefit and has to keep it for four years. So yeah, it's, it's definitely very important you pay attention to those service contracts and especially the ones that transfer to the new owner. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, by the way, like for these cable contracts, uh, where did you see it? Because sometimes they are hidden, right? Like either they put it under utilities or are they like at least explicitly mentioned that cable contract services or somewhere? Yeah, it, it, was, it was under utilities, but there was a sub account under utilities for cable. Oh, okay. So it was pretty obvious that it was cable. I just had to find out, you know, the, the, um, if that transferred to the new owner, which it did. And then also I had to find out when that cable contract expired and when I could get out of it, because I had to make sure in my pro forma to account for that expense until the date that I could terminate that contract. Okay. Yep. Then, uh, yeah. So how much, uh, going back to the purchase price, so it's around 30. So how much was the purchase price that you get this? The purchase price was 1.32 million. So it was, it was right at 33,000 a door. Okay. Then the, how, how many like uh, is the economic occupancy for the property? It's pretty bad. So it was, it was about 60 to 65% economic occupancy and around 77% physical okay. on the day that we took ownership. Okay, then I guess uh, this one will be just a, a bank bank loan or a credit union kind of. Right. Yep. It was a local bank loan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then uh, how much was the loan amount, or are you able to get for this one? It was uh, one point three three six million. So it was a loan to cost. If you've noticed, the loan amount was more than the purchase price. It's because we had a, a rehab budget and we were able to wrap that into the total loan. Okay. Then the local bank at least like uh, so own. I mean. You, you got it from the local bank only, not having another secondary or supplement loan. Right, just one loan. Mm -hmm. okay. And the, the local bank that I dealt with was super flexible. I mean, they literally dropped the rehab funds directly into my account. There was no draw process that you would uh -huh. see with most bridge lenders. So it was, it was very flexible and easy process. But of course, that relationship had to be there for that to happen too. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah, what was the CapEx budget that you were anticipating? Originally, we had a CapEx budget of 350, 350,000, and, and that's what the loan was based on. But 
um, right around the time that we closed or a few weeks before we closed, we actually changed our business plan a little bit and decided to add um, washer and dryer hookups to 20 of the units, half of the units. So because of that, we had to increase our rehab budget to 400,000, but that extra 50 would just have to come out of pocket at that point because we had already you know, got our loan approved. Mm -hmm. So basically 400,000, even though the initial plan was 350. Okay, yeah. Then uh, how much was the loan interest on this one? We had interest only for 18 months on this one originally. So we only had to pay interest only payments for 18 months and then principal and interest payments starting after that. And we had 80% um, loan to cost. I was thinking of other terms. I don't know if I've told you the terms. I don't think I have. It was a, a five year total term on this and a 20 year AM. And the interest only was tacked onto that term. So we basically had six and a half year term if you add the interest only to that period. We had a um, five and a half percent interest rate. Anything else I'm forgetting terms wise? I think I think I pretty much covered yeah, everything. Yeah, I think that's covered. So yeah. it's a five year term. Yeah, the, the six and a half percent was the what's the difference between the six you mentioned two interest, six and a half and the five. Uh, I said a six and a half year term. So we had a balloon, you know, we have a balloon payment due six and a half years after. So it was a 20 year amortization, but a six and a half year oh, six and a half term. Years. Yeah. Then term. Five, five the, the interest rate was five and a half. Okay. Got mm -hmm. it. Then, uh, yeah, then this uh, deal was set uh, like a JV or you, you only, you're the only one who purchased it. Uh, so. Right. Yeah. Just, I'm the, I was the only one on this deal. Oh, nice. Nice. Then uh, your business plan here is like a renovate and uh, fix the occupancy for this in that washer dryer hookup. Yep, those are the main three points: renovate, raise rents, you know, typical value add stuff, increase occupancy, increase collections, and lower the water bill. Those were the, the high points there. Okay. Okay. Then are you? Uh, what's your exit strategy on this? Like, are you holding or eventually selling it? We actually had to pivot a little bit on that too. So our initial exit strategy was to refi around year two once we had stabilized and we were going to refi to agency debt and pull our capital back because we could pull 100% and then some capital back at that point and also have more favorable terms you know, on the rate and the amortization. So that was our original plan. Then COVID hit and we got a little bit nervous like around April just because you know our, we only had five years left on the term and I just wasn't sure we would even be able to refi to agency because agency was doing all this crazy stuff with, you know, not lending at the time there for a little bit. We didn't know what was going to happen. So back in April, I requested a loan modification from my local bank lender and they modified my loan to a three and a half percent interest rate, a 10 year fixed term, still a 20, 20 year am, but a 10 year fixed term and then an additional 18 months of interest only. So because I got that loan modification and now my terms are, are really good, it really doesn't make sense to refi at this point. I might take out a supplemental loan if I need the capital. Like right now there's not enough deals to buy and there's too much money floating around. So I don't necessarily need a supplemental right now, but at some point I may go that route. But for now I'm just enjoying the cash flow and no plan to refi at the moment. And as far as ultimate exit strategy, we're looking to exit around year five to six. Yeah, I think that that's a good, uh... I mean, loan modification, especially the, the interest, like uh, the three and a half. It was huge. It added an instant 2000 a month to cash flow just because of the interest rate change there. Yep. Yep. That's really good. Then, uh, so this is not, yeah, this is a single di uh, ownership. Yeah. For the due diligence, uh, can you explain to us like how, what different kinds of due diligence that you have done on this uh, property? So due diligence, physical and financial due diligence, I guess I'll just walk through uh, the main points would be the lease audit. So for this particular property, the leases were not electronic. So we had to physically go to the office uh, at the time and sit down and go through lease after lease and, and do all of our lease auditing on site. So my property manager and I did that and kind of tag teamed it and went through all the high points. And we had an Excel file where we tracked, you know, and compared to the rent roll to make sure it was accurate the lease start and end dates, the rental rates, the deposits, you know, any additional charges, pet rent, or, um, you know, any, any additional addendums to the lease or anything like that. We've noted all of that. And we also checked, since we had their entire file, we also checked 
their application because that was in the file. So we like to look at the credit score, income verification, what job did they have, just to kind of get a better feel for the, the resident profile there. And we also check their file to see if they had any non-compliance notices or pay or quit notices just to see, you know, just how bad or good the residents were at that time to know which ones later that, you know, to kind of plan out a rent schedule of which ones are we not going to renew, which ones do we want to keep, which ones have been late a lot of times that we need to be aware of. So that was the lease audit in a nutshell. And then, of course, our physical due diligence. We walked all 40 units. We also had a, our property manager walk the units with us. And then we also had a contractor walk the units with us and, and the contractor bid the project for us. So mm -hmm. he walked the unit. So he kind of kind of served two purposes, kind of like as, as a backup to our inspection. Like if he saw anything concerning, he told us. And then also um, he he basically just made his scope of work based on what he saw and then sent us a bid for the, the rehab project as well. So other than unit walks and lease audit, just typical third party report stuff, survey, you know, Alta, the Alta survey that we had to have and um, the plumbing scope and the basic inspection. We luckily got those as freebies kind of because the, the broker that had it under contract had those done as part of his whole portfolio purchase. So he very generously gave those to us so we didn't have to go that route. And then of course the title search that you'd have to do with all deals. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. I think yeah, that, that, that's good. Then uh, regarding the contractor, did you uh, look for it or the property management uh, has its own contractor? The property management company had those contacts. Okay. So yeah, he, he, he recommended the, the GC firm that he thought would be a best fit for our project based on his past experience with that firm on other projects. Okay, man, that's nice. Then, uh, yeah, I think we'll skip the capital raise since you did it on your own. Yeah, how much capital, by the way, like, did you do um, to start with, like uh, the down payment plus all the closing score that you need to shell out? It was around 400000 Okay. Then, um, then the closing costs on this, like how long did it take at least from, I guess, the, that buyer then reselling it back to you? Yeah, the whole process from the point that I originally submitted the first LOI to my closing was about six months, six to seven months. But of course, I was only under contract for two months. It was just because I had to wait on the broker to buy the portfolio yeah. for me to be able to go under contract. So I was just constantly watching and waiting and emailing him. How's it going? Are you still going to close? Because it's just kind of on the hook, not knowing if, you know, that would go through, first of all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. At least uh, that, that good. Uh, at least it ended up uh, nicely, especially even like during COVID, like uh, you were able to still now get at least a good amount of uh, cash flow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Then uh, I think we reached the end of the show where I ask uh, each uh, guest that I have this final five uh, sizzling questions. So the first one is any lessons learned that you want to share uh, based on your experience on this uh, deal? The biggest lesson I learned, and this was a very typical newbie mistake I should have known, but always, always have a, a contingency or a buffer in your rehab budgets because there's always going to be surprises. You know, luckily I, this was my own deal, so I didn't have investors to answer to, and I could just, you know, use cash flow if I needed to. But we ended up going over budget by about 10% on this project. We didn't have a buffer though. <laughs> like I literally, the whole 400,000 was going straight to rehab. There was no contingency, so definitely always work in a five or 10% contingency with any rehab budget. That's a given kind of common sense. I should have known, but didn't at the time. And then the second thing is the timing of when you close during the month is important on some deals more than others, especially on mom and pop deals or smaller deals. Um, just because this deal, we closed on the 8th of August of, of 2019. And because it was the 8th and because all of these residents mailed their rent, they didn't pay online just because of the resident class that was there. All the rent was in the mail to the previous owner. And even though we had that rents, you know, would, would have to be sent to me after closing, it was just a headache and a pain to have to chase down the rent and figure out who had paid and who hadn't to know who to send notices to. And it was just kind of a mess. So would have been a lot easier if we had closed like on the 25th or so of the month. So we, since this deal, we've tried to time our closings a little bit better. Okay. So it should be like uh, near the, the end of the month. 
I like around the 25th, 20th to 25th, because that's usually time to collect most of the rent for that month and it'd be prorated at closing, but it still gives you that window of time to send out notices or your property management company to send out notices to the residents and introduce themselves and make sure they get set up to pay the new management company. That way the next month's rent doesn't go to the previous owner. So it's kind of a, a balance you have to find there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Then uh, I think that then the second question, uh, any uh, recommended books? Uh, the very first book that I actually read on multifamily, I think it's a great book. It's Crushing It in Apartments and Commercial Real Estate. And that's by Brian Murray. It's the first book I ever read, and it, it really motivated me to jump into the multifamily space. And I was actually able to meet Brian Murray at a conference. That was really cool. He's a great guy. So highly recommend that book. And then the other book that's had a big impact on my life is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Just a, a great book to apply to everyday life and everyday <laughs> human interaction. You know, it's not just about negotiations. It's really just about um, you know, human interactions in general and how to navigate that. So it's one of those books I could read multiple times and pick up something from it every time I read it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that never split the difference. Yeah, that's really good in uh, understanding the, the other person's point of view. Mm -hmm. Also negotiating. Like, uh, yep. Yep. Then uh, for the third question, uh, any recommended uh, podcast or YouTube channel that you are listening to and uh, would recommend? Yeah, so I'm sure that most of your guests have probably given a lot of the same ones, like some of the most popular ones out there are the most listened to. So I wanted to, to give two recommendations for a podcast that I really enjoy that, that maybe aren't as big as some of the big names yet, but I think they're well on their way to being there. And the first one is Julie Holly's Ask Me How I Know, or the Ask Me How I Know show, I think it's going by now. I really love that. I love the laid back vibe of that podcast. And, you know, you, you learn about the the real world multifamily lessons from, from the guests. So I really like that one. And then the second one is Brian Briscoe's Diary of an Apartment Investor. He has a unique format where he brings on an inexperienced investor or like an aspiring investor and he brings on a more experienced investor. And then he'll have the, the aspiring investor ask questions to the experienced investor. And it's like a, it's a, it's a nice back and forth there and it's just different. It's a different format and I really like it. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully I'll start listening to Brian. I'm attending his meetup. So uh, yeah, I'll mm -hmm. start listening to his uh, podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, for your uh, uh, fourth question, uh, so this is the time uh, to promote yourself. Uh, what's your acquisition criteria for multifamily in terms of loca location, units? then this is to let everyone know and reach out to you if they have deals on those uh, areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sure. So we're looking in three markets right now, Huntsville, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, and in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're seeking 50 to 200 unit properties in B and C class and B class areas like everyone else. <laughs> we're looking for 70s and newer, preferably 80s and newer with a value add play. And we are always willing to sponsor or JV or, or co-GP if you find a, deal, find a deal and you need help bringing that deal to the finish line. And absolutely feel free to reach out if it's in one of those three markets. We'd be happy to help. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. Then I'll put also those uh, criteria in the, in the show notes. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, what's the best con uh, con uh, contact, to, contact information to reach you at? Facebook's a great way to reach me. You can look me up on Facebook, Candace Pilgrim. Feel free to send me a friend request or send me a message. Uh, you can also check out my website at www.apollocapitalinvestments.com or you can email me at Candice at apollocapitalinvestments.com. Okay, then I'll put uh, Candice information also on the show notes. Uh, her direct, at least Facebook link, so you don't need to search. I have, I have her link then, uh, yeah. So uh, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Candy. So it was really uh, fantastic to have you here in the show. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. <laughs> All right, thanks.